So good afternoon, uh, everyone, uh, at least those here on the East Coast. Uh, for the rest of you, uh, good morning. Uh, to kick things off, we're going to do our webinar on healthy habitats for healthy wildlife. And I'm going to turn it over here in a second to our host, Leslie McCormick, with the North Carolina Tree Fire Program. But let me just touch on logistics really quick for today's webinar. If you have questions, we ask that you use the Q&A feature of Zoom. Just click on that little Q&A icon and you'll be able to enter your questions there. If other issues come up, feel free to enter those into chat and I will try to respond to you back through chat to try to solve any issues you might have. Also, today's slides and resources that will be mentioned are available back on the portal where you join today's webinar and you can get those um, at any time. They'll be there available even after today's webinar is done. And so those resources will be available for you. Leslie? Thanks, Bob. And thanks everyone for joining us today for the third quarter webinar from the North Carolina Tree Farm Program. Wanted to make you aware of a few other events we have coming up. On October 3rd and 4th, we will have an advanced training for natural resource professionals and experienced landowners on restoring oak forest. You can learn more about that uh, workshop, um, which will be in the classroom and in the field on our website at nctreefarm.org. You can access an agenda and register there. Um, our other uh, webinar we have coming up for the fourth quarter is on November 2nd on building and maintaining trails, and we invite you to put that on your calendar. We will open registration up for that about a month out. So put that on your calendar and hope you can join us then. And finally, if you would like more information about the North Carolina Tree Farm Program, uh, please visit our website or reach out to me at nctreefarm at gmail.com. We're happy to answer your questions and invite you to engage with us. Um, now I'd like to introduce our speaker for today is Sarah Vandenberg. Sarah is a wildlife health biologist with the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission. She started her wildlife biology career chasing weasels around the woods for the state of Connecticut, she says, and joined the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission Wildlife Health Program in 2019. She spends most of her time supporting the agency's disease research efforts, but her favorite days are the ones that leave her boots muddy and her clothes smelling of bug spray. Sarah, we appreciate your taking time to be with us today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm going to grab the screen controls and uh, let's get started. You guys can see that all right? We can. Thank you, Bob. All right. Well, thank you for that introduction, Leslie and Bob. I'm quite excited to get to speak with you all this afternoon. Normally when I'm asked to present, it's on a very focused topic, uh, specifically like high path avian influenza or you know chronic waste disease. It's actually pretty rare that I get to talk about disease from a more elevated perspective, and it's been a lot of fun to build this out. So I hope you enjoy at least bits and pieces of it. I can't jump right in and start talking about diseases in wildlife without spending time talking about the places where wildlife live. Generically, we call a community of interacting species and the non-living things they also interact with, like rocks and streams in the sun. That's an ecosystem. Habitat is a similar but looser term. It contains just the general information a particular species, or excuse me, the general environment a particular species lives in. It's more focused. Uh, that said, I'm sure I'll use the term somewhat interchangeably in this talk, as most people do. But just for your knowledge, there is technically a difference between the two. Ecosystems are interactions like a neighborhood and habitats are focused on one species, more like an individual house. Nothing in the natural world, particularly if we're gonna talk about wildlife exists in isolation. A simplified food lab like this one is a great way to visualize that. And it's probably not the first time you've seen something like it. The stability in an ecosystem comes from being built from the bottom up with a sustainable ecosystem having the most energy and abundance at the bottom in the producer slot. And that's where the plants are, converting soil nutrients and sun into energy. 
we work our way up with organisms that require increasingly more energy. And therefore, there are fewer of those animals in the, in the food chain. And then we get to the very top, and that's where the apex predators exist in the smallest of numbers. But being at the top is not all sunshine and rainbows. With all of the energy in an ecosystem below that top spot, there's intense pressure on those very few animals to maintain positions, find mates, hold larger territories so they can collect enough food to survive, reproduce, rear young. Creating an imbalance in this web could have devastating effects on those relationships within it, even indirect ones. And severing some connections completely could lead to the extinction of a species. And we do see that occur. At a lower level, where there's more abundance and energy, an otherwise stable ecosystem might be able to fill the gap and regain organization and function, but significant loss at a higher level might not be as easily recoverable. The right disease in the right place could do serious damage in a short period of time, or it could do longer term chronic damage that's more difficult for an ecosystem to recover from. In this example, which again, very simple, missing species, but if a disease were to wipe out beetles, it would also in turn remove frogs, raccoons, and black bears as their food source is now gone. And that puts a lot of pressure on field mice to support foxes, wolves, and hawks. Pressure that it once shared with beetles, frogs, and raccoons, but now it supports it alone. The mice might not be able to handle that additional pressure, particularly if it occurs over a short period of time. And if they're gone, well, that's pretty much the collapse of this entire ecosystem or this food web. So if an ecosystem is all about relationships and interconnectedness, then this definition of a healthy ecosystem is absolutely my favorite. It was developed in 1999 by Robert Costanza and Michael Magot. They're an aquatic ecologist and a professor of environment and sustainability. While they were looking uh, at creating an assessment tool for aquatic habitats, they developed uh, this definition. Now the word sustainability was all the rage in the early 2000s as it continues to be today and often the term sustainability doesn't mean much anymore as it's being used commercially and for advertisements without any real explanation of what they need. So at least here in the context of ecosystem health sustainability was defined to mean an ecosystem that can maintain its organization vigor and resilience in the face of external stress. Humans put a lot of external stress on the ecosystems we inhabit as we engineer and manipulate the natural world to meet our needs. We have a bit of a history of bringing disease with us as well when we move about. The first recorded ideas of human manipulation of natural habitats being correlated with disease outbreaks came from this guy, this is Charles Elton. He was one of the first people to step back and study plants and animals together as one organism at a time when single species biology was much more in fashion. Charles Elton was the first to document cyclic predator-prey relationships and laid the foundation to what has become modern-day animal ecology, much of which is in textbooks today, if you take biology or ecology classes. And all that's based off of his observations and research. There is absolutely no doubt in my mind that native people around the world had long handed down the same knowledge within their own cultures and verbal histories. It's just that Elton wrote these learnings and observances down from his own experience and, and he was quite vocal about sharing them through Western Europe, but many of his ideas were spoken about prior to his texts. He went on in his career to study invasive species and contributed a great deal to that aspect of ecology as well. And it was in that latter portion of his career while studying invasive species that he made this comment. One of the most influential people in modern ecology noted the connection between disease outbreaks and habitat degradation at a time when scientists really weren't all that interested in looking at these bigger picture ideas of interconnectivity. They were certainly not considering relationships at that time between wildlife and human health either. The link between human health and agriculture were well known, but wildlife was not included in greater discussions about public health. So that comment from Elton, for those who aren't able to read it, says outbreaks of infectious diseases most often happen on cultivated or planted land, that is, in habitats and communities very much simplified by man. Now, I find Elton's comment from the late 50s quite striking, considering this, the One Health model, wasn't introduced until after the SARS-CoV-1 outbreak that ended in 2004. So leave it to coronaviruses to get everyone talking about the role of wildlife in public health and not only agriculture. But One Health picked up steam in earnest in 2020 with COVID-19, or COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2. With every new disease, more conversations are being had between public health, agriculture, 
and now wildlife and other agencies that all have some expertise to contribute to the conversation. In 2021, the UN Environment Program released a joint statement defining One Health. And I'm going to read that to you now, but bear with me. It's, it's a bit of a long one. One Health is an integrated, unifying approach that aims to sustainably balance and optimize the health of people, animals, and ecosystems. It recognizes the health of humans, domestic and wild animals, plants, and the wider environment, including ecosystems, are closely linked and interdependent. The approach mobilizes multiple sectors, disciplines, and communities at varying levels of society to work together to foster well-being and tackle threats to health and ecosystems while addressing the collective need for clean water, energy and air, safe and nutritious food, taking action on climate change, and contributing to a sustainable development. That is quite the mission we have been assigned. And after decades of biologists commenting on the role of the environment and wildlife, and what they have to play in the transmission and the mitigation of diseases, and also the role of human activity on wildlife disease, it's nice to have a seat at the table. So if that's ecosystem health and One Health, what, and One Health has a, an aspect of wildlife health involved in it, what is wildlife health? It seems like this concept would be pretty intuitive. The World Health, uh, the World Organization for Animal Health, or WOA, has a statement about wildlife requiring biodiversity and interconnectivity to be healthy. And the Biologic Research Institute managed to boil it down to the inability of wildlife to thrive in a changing environment. But I think it's fair to say that we're still at a work in progress. Like what we have collectively decided in the wildlife health field is that the definition we've been using since the 50s is not good enough. That definition was merely that healthy wildlife are absent of disease. But it's more complicated than that. Not all diseases are bad, and that definition doesn't address ecosystem and habitat interconnectivity or ecosystem resilience. So where do humans fit into this interconnected web? I've got a local example. Uh, most people on this call will no doubt recognize this location. To the top right is Pisgah National Forest. To the bottom left is Nantahala National Forest, and that is Asheville, North Carolina, right in the middle. The forests are 13 miles apart along that line I drew. A male black bear could cover that in a day or two, maybe three or four days for a female if she was so inclined. And the dispersal age deer, about a year and a half old, regularly go that distance away from their natal herds. To make that trip without crossing agricultural fields, neighborhoods, strip malls, or cleared land, it was a total of 23 miles, and there were five major highway crossings and numerous small road crossings, and actually you have to cross the French Broad River at least twice. And it was only possible at all because a lot of this is protected by the Blue Ridge Parkway. That Asheville area surrounded by a lot of forested land far more so than the coast and the Piedmont in North Carolina. So here's the Raleigh version. This is Umstead State Park. It's the same uh, map in both pictures, just the satellite imagery on the left. Given its size and location, this is a heavily utilized park. There are people in it all the time. The trails are pretty worn down. The deer are extremely comfortable around humans. And it's entirely bounded by major highways, quarries with active blasting, our international airport, RDU, and you might even make out the light colored line that runs through the middle of the park over in the satellite image. That's a power line corridor. As far as I could tell, there is not can any connected forested or even lightly treed areas that would allow animals to move between Umstead and Butner Falls Noose Game Lens, which is just to the north. It's maybe three miles away. Umstead State Park is effectively an island for the species who live there. Well, unless they're birds and they can fly, but for the terrestrial species anyway. Habitat fragmentation occurs when contiguous habitat is split apart. In North Carolina, that's most commonly due to roads and agricultural fields, but increasingly it's due to urban sprawl as cities accommodate the increased need for housing. This causes two main problems. Wildlife cannot easily navigate across areas they used to move freely through. Think turtles crossing roads to lay eggs, deer bolting across highways, even if it means leaving a fawn stranded behind them. Smaller mammals may be unwilling to be that exposed at all, and they won't even risk the attempt. And that leaves populations isolated genetically with very little interchange between groups. And it increases the competition for those remaining parcels of land and the resources that they hold. 
It can leave some species so removed from other populations or those ecological relationships that they need to survive that they ultimately die off. The second major problem is the creation of edge habitat, which is exactly as it sounds. It's the cut border of a particular habitat, along with about 100 meters of habitat from that cut edge inward. It happens most commonly around roads, and it's not typically a soft change like it would be in nature. It's stark. You go from thick brush to dirt and asphalt. Birds and small mammals, which can do well in edge habitats, they can find themselves exposed and at risk of injury or predation at sudden borders where there once was a softer edge, beginning with less dense trees, increased shrubs, tall grasses, and then ultimately fading into lower vegetation. Often related to the activities that cause habitat fragmentation and edge formation is habitat degradation. And this occurs when the conditions change from the overall makeup of the habitat, leaving formerly diverse forests with similar age species structures of the trees with poor quality soils, muddied or completely filled in vernal pools, or poor water quality in creeks due to runoff. That habitat may no longer be able to support the number or diversity of the species it once did. So near me, the rush to build subdivisions is so great they're clear cutting the building lots to build as many homes as quickly as possible. One stretch of road, which was entirely forested on either side, now has four new housing divisions along it where there once was forested land. And this has occurred in a little over a year. For some migratory species, they're going to return this fall and find the habitat they once utilized is now a clear cut, muddy lot with heavy equipment, houses, streets, and bright lighting. It's unlikely to be home to their prey species any longer, or they may not be able to provide the cover and protection they once had there. And this is where managed forests and tree farms have the opportunity to play a really important role for wildlife. It allows them access and safe passage from one piece of habitat to another. That bit of transit space could make all the difference for some species. We look at a lot of diseases uh, at the commission in species like wild turkey and grouse, quail, uh, songbirds, muskrats, raccoons even. But by far the single most important thing that impacts the population numbers of any species is proper habitat. If they have somewhere to live that meets their needs, wild animals are remarkably resilient. So I pulled a couple examples of diseases that we see here in the Southeast. Now, most people will probably think of bacteria and viruses, maybe even a fungus that affects wildlife. But the first one I'm going to talk about is not any of those. It's a parasite. Echinococcus canadensis is a type of tapeworm that's found in parts of the US, Canada and Scandinavia. Its definitive hosts are canids, so dogs, wolves, coyotes, foxes. Those are the species where, tape, where this tapeworm can reach its adult form and produce eggs. It typically doesn't cause illness in canids. Those eggs are expelled along with fecal material wherever that animal goes and the cycle continues. But there's a catch. Cervids, so deer, elk, moose, they can act as an intermediate host to Echinococcus canadensis, where they can pick up the juvenile form of the tapeworm, but it can't complete its life cycle and produce eggs. So what's happening in this picture are eggs deposited on the landscape by a wolf. That's letter A. Then a moose comes grazing along uh, and picks up the tapeworm larvae. That's letter B. Those larvae can then migrate out of the moose's digestive tract and into their lungs, creating these large cysts called hydatid cysts. Those are letters C and D. And it can make them very, very ill and impair their breathing if it doesn't kill them outright. It impacts them enough uh, when they are alive so that they can't run away as fast. The disease allows the moose to be more easily caught by wolves. These ill moose are an important food source for the persistence of the wolf population. That's letter E. And letter F is the completion of the parasite cycle where adult worms can grow and a wolf can pass along the eggs. It's actually a balanced ecological system. Yes, there is disease, but not at a level that the moose population can't withstand. And without moose to prey upon, the wolves would struggle to find enough food uh, to survive long term. And this is a real system that occurs in, in Canada. Um, a few years ago, on the other side of Canada, in the Eastern Maritime uh, area, moose started dying. So in Nova Scotia, where wolves were extirpated, coyotes have moved in and they fill that predator role. But coyotes are far better adapted to living alongside humans. They are not shy, they're not picky eaters, and they thrive in edge and urbanized habitats. So in 2021, Echinococcus canadensis was identified in hydatid cysts in some moose lungs, as well as in fecal material from coyotes. But the belief prior to that was since there were no wolves, 
there would be no Mechanococcus canadensis. And so there was no need to do any surveillance, no wolves, no parasites. There's a problem though. This tapeworm can infect people in much the same way as moose. It causes cysts in the lungs. Those cysts can rupture and cause severe illness and death in children and adults. In areas where habitat fragmentation has put humans, livestock, and pets abutting wolf and moose habitat, the risk of humans contracting Echinococcus or livestock uh, contracting Echinococcus also increases. Now, people can't contract this parasite from eating moose. Uh, humans are considered a dead end host for it, but dogs can contract it and they're definitive hosts like wolves are. That puts people at risk of contracting this parasite from their dogs. On an international scale, the World Health Organization recognizes human cystic hydatid disease caused by Echinococcus as a neglected and underreported disease. Now, this does occur here in the US, although it's much more common in impoverished areas with overall poorer hygiene. So what about removing wolves? Well, removing wolves from the landscape might decrease that parasite temporarily, but as Nova Scotia has observed in recent years, in the absence of wolves, coyotes thrive. And unlike wolves, coyotes live really well near people, even in dense cities. Removing coyotes typically increases the coyote population. With fewer coyotes and more available resources, you get a coyote baby boom. So maybe there are other ways we can break the parasite cycle. If we don't have wolves or moose in North Carolina, so why does it even matter? Well, we do have dogs and we have coyotes and we have elk and white-tailed deer. And there's a nastier species of Echinococcus making its way towards North Carolina called Echinococcus multilacularis. It's probably for the best not to encourage coyotes to stick near your residents for a multitude of reasons, but they are an important species to help maintain balance in the overall ecosystem since we don't have a large apex predator like wolves roaming around most of the state. Cats are host to species of Echinococcus, but not specifically Canadensis. So creating good bobcat habitat could diminish some parasite transmission between canids and cervids. Rodents can carry a different subspecies of Echinococcus, which is similar uh, to Canadensis. And while rolling in poo is difficult to stop dogs from doing, I know that personally, I've got two dogs who love to roll in everything. At least be aware that the potential parasites and other germs that they were in the feces are now all over your dog's fur and soon to be in your car and on your couch. It's one step closer to you than you would probably like them to be. With enough species diversity in one area, the overall parasite load in that environment will be decreased. Not all parasites are infective to all species. So that phrase, break the parasite cycle, can really come into play by having species around that aren't contributing to the spread of a specific parasite. So episodic hemorrhagic disease virus and blue tongue virus. These are viruses. In fact, they're two different ones. They're bloodborne viruses of ruminants. So deer, cattle, sheep, goats, moose, elk, animals with four chambered stomachs. Both viruses have the same symptoms in the field, so we group them together and we just call them hemorrhagic disease. And while they are viruses, they're not spread directly deer to deer, and humans can't contract these viruses either. So globally, EHDV, or episodic hemorrhagic disease virus, has seven serotypes, and it has some historic record of being in wild deer since at least the 1800s. Blue tongue virus has 27 serotypes globally and is more common in domestic animals. It doesn't tend to cause severe illness in cattle, but more commonly, it is fatal to sheep and to deer. This is a vector-borne disease. A biting midge, that, that picture over on the left there, is coelacoides, or noceums, as we call them. These biting insects are absolutely tiny, but they can cause a lot of mortality within one summer. Hemorrhagic disease is not 100% fatal in all individual animals. Some of them will develop chronic illness that lasts weeks or months, and others can reco recover from even acute illness. But for many animals, it is fatal. Deer populations can be impacted severely on a local level, but overall, the deer population will recover. If you noted a lot of dead deer last summer as you drove around the state, or caught that smell of sort of rotting flesh, particularly near ponds and creeks, that's what was happening. We had a pretty rough year with this last year. And this is a cyclic disease. It's part of the uh, the name, the EHDV name, actually, episodic. It means it recurs in episodes. Deer who do survive infection do not have immunity for very long, maybe a few months, maybe a year. 
and it doesn't cross protect them from any other serotypes, meaning a deer can be infected by EHDV2, EHDV6, and blue tongue 11 all in the same summer potentially. And we've actually seen a few deer that um, through lab testing have confirmed co-infections. So this deer, uh, this disease rather causes deer blood cells to rupture. They get swollen tongues, lesions on their mouths, they can't walk properly, they can have neurologic impairment, they can become quite thin in chronic cases as it's difficult for them to eat, and many become feverish and seek out water to cool off in, and that's often where we find them after they've passed. It's a tough disease, but the deer here in North Carolina have evolved alongside at least some serotypes of hemorrhagic disease. It can impact local populations really hard, but within a few years, the population does rebound and there's no lasting harm done to the overall deer herd, which we have about 1.2 million deer in the state of North Carolina. Uh, but there are things that can make this cyclic virus worse or better, and it has a lot to do with habitat degradation. Midges breed and develop around warm, wet ground, streams, ponds, creeks, sure, but also mud, manure piles, moist organic soils. Climate change, meaning more rain and warmer weather, clear cutting, even wind patterns can assist in the spread of midges into more northern and western regions where deer are less accustomed to hemorrhagic disease. Novel serotypes uh, to the southeast are introduced by moving livestock and importing exotic animals. Once those animals are in the area, midges can transport the novel viruses to wildlife. And this has happened in North Carolina in 2006. There were six ca sick cattle who had EHDV2. And this is now the most common serotype we see in North Carolina, and it can wipe out hundreds of deer over the course of a few months. But deer can have some limited immunity to hemorrhagic disease and they can survive the infection. And those animals are really important members of the deer herd the next year or later in the year when hemorrhagic appears on the landscape again. If enough animals with some degree of immune protection exist, we get a larger effect of herd immunity. The disease can't effectively spread across long distances if there are enough deer in between that aren't getting sick. Low levels of hemorrhagic disease in the deer herd actually has a protective effect on the larger population because that immunity doesn't last very long. Fractured habitats, stressed wildlife, damaged environments equal better breeding grounds for disease vectors and more concentrated populations of animals to be infected. And that leads to larger scale mortality events and fewer animals on the landscape with these, even the short term immunity. So deer aren't passing these viruses along to each other, but Coolicoides midges are extremely small and they typically stay within two kilometers of their wet muddy spot that they came from. A breezy day can take them hundreds of miles and help spread the viruses with them. That we can't do much about. But the more deer are compacted into a single area, the more likely a midge will have a blood meal on an infected animal and then come in contact with another deer who may be a naive and passing the virus along. It then amplifies the infection within a population. So deer don't need to be fed from feeders or bird feeders. Neither do birds, but we'll get to that in a minute. Beyond clustering a bunch of deer together in one spot, supplemental feeding can impact the deer's overall health in a negative way. Less diverse food source means less healthy gut microbes, a less sturdy animal, and more exposure to disease if they're all together. So if they are infected by hemorrhagic disease, this extra stress isn't going to help them. Midges need warm, slow moving or stagnant water to breathe. The better the drainage, the cleaner the water, the fewer the biting bugs. And it helps with mosquitoes too. Fish, frogs, swallows, spiders are all predators of biting midges and they're an important food source for them. So if you build habitat for tree swallows or support vernal pools for frogs, you can help out deer as a side effect. If you want to directly help deer, support your local fishing spiders and diving beetles and dragonflies. So my, my last example for this one is a bacteria. And if you're a, if you're a birder, even just a casual birder, you've probably seen this. Uh, this is Mycoplasma galliceptacum, originally documented in domestic poultry. It causes respiratory illnesses in domestic poultry, and the impact on wildlife really wasn't anyone's concern in agriculture. So in the 90s, though, house finches were getting conjunctivitis and dying in fairly large numbers. And unlike domestic poultry, the bacteria doesn't cause respiratory illness in finches, nor does it directly kill the birds. It causes the eye membranes to swell, and that impacts their vision. Many starve, they die from exposure, they just can't see well enough to fly away from predators. 
This bacteria transmits very readily through direct contact, but also through tube-shaped feeders or any feeder where birds have to uh, push their heads through a space to make contact to access food and uh, or water. Uh, and collecting those birds uh, in the same place means you're allowing that bacteria to transmit to the next birds or birds in line. And since these birds aren't feeling well, these ill birds aren't feeling well and they can't see to uh, properly fly, they tend to hang around the same spots and they can infect a lot of birds that are coming to that one location. House finches are not native to Eastern US. They're a Southwestern species, but they're certainly common across the US now, and they're a common site in North Carolina backyards. Actually, the entire Eastern population is due to a release of failed pet Hollywood finches, as they were coined, on Long Island, New York in the 1940s. I find this cartoon amusing, but it is also accurate. Um, but what that meant in the 90s is that when mycoplasma barged into the finch scene, there were all of these birds, which were genetically very similar, with no previous exposure to this bacteria. They're not native to the ecosystem, and they had a limited access to native food sources in East Coast backyards. So they're congregating at feeders, eating all the sunflower seeds. And it didn't take long before the disease was passed on to other native birds, and we now see it pretty regularly in goldfinches, grosbeaks, and purple finches as well. In 2006, the disease was documented in the western house finch population, and it actually needed to spread all the way up to the Pacific Northwest before coming down the western side of the Rockies and into the western house finch population there. So many diseases are exacerbated by congregating wildlife into one place. Native plants add more benefit than just bird food. They can serve as nesting material and protection from predators. They help with erosion control and keeping the soil cool in the summer. So be pro-native plants wherever you can be. Our native wildlife is adapted for certain plants and certain habitats. Many of them can make do without it, but all of those little changes increase the stress on the population and on individuals. Like I love bird feeders and I've occasionally put them up in my own yard during the spring and fall migrations, but I don't keep them up all year. Firstly, keeping them up properly and keeping them clean is a real pain. Even if you don't see any active uh, disease on your feeders, for the health of the songbirds, the feeders and bird baths should be taken down at least once every two weeks, unless it's a hummingbird feeder that needs to come down once or twice per week and cleaned properly. And the same goes for bird baths. If you see a sick bird, a two week feeder uh, and bath hiatus can give the sick birds time to recover if they are going to, and it prevents them from at least using your yard as a place to spread germs to other birds. It also helps if your neighbors take their birds feeders down at that time too. So birds can pass um, this particular um, bacteria directly to each other via shared contact and shared spaces. So a habitat that has lots of places to forage uh, for food and to find cover will not only support more species overall, and it lessens conflicts over piles of food in a feeder, some birds are bullies, but it also decreases the incidence of direct contact between birds, which may be spreading germs. As I've mentioned repeatedly in this particular talk, habitat is king when it comes to supporting wildlife and mitigating the effects of disease. If there's a species you want to invite on your property and they theoretically exist nearby or migrate overhead, provide them with the things they need to live as low stress a life as possible. Food, water, shelter, nesting bedding places. They will show up eventually. And in the process, you'll be making good habitat for other animals to thrive in. Tree farms and managed forests are in a really unique position that most agricultural farm owners and homeowners aren't in. You typically manage larger plots of connected land, and you do so with a long-term goal of sustainable tree harvest and land stewardship. And that lends itself really well to making small improvements here and there that can support the wild animal and bird populations in your areas. If you ever have an area that isn't producing the way you like and you're considering laying it foul for a while, perhaps an ideal spot for some wild turkey habitat or quail or a species of greatest concern um, that's local to you. Well, I'll leave you with a few journal headlines from the last 10 years or so. I apologize to those of you who thought I'd have some magic answer on how we prevent the spread of disease in wildlife. There is no magic answer. But there's a catalog of 70 plus years of observations and research that intimately ties biodiversity loss uh, due to humans with increasing numbers and increasing severity of infectious disease. Biodiversity is built from the ground up. Good quality habitat supports the organization, 
vigor, and resilience of native species and of the surrounding ecosystem. And keep in mind that if an ecosystem is a neighborhood and habitats are a house, you don't need to be working on a long, uh, large scale to make a difference. I'm sure there's a colony of bats that would love to take care of your mosquito and moth problem if only had they had a proper house to roost in. It can be small changes. And with that, I'll say thank you for having me. Um, and uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and we'll see what we have for, for questions. All right. Thank you, Sarah. So, folks, if you have questions, please at this time enter them into the Q&A feature. We do have a couple questions that come in. We did get one in chat. Let me do that first. Uh, it was from Stephanie. Uh, they're in Montrose, NNK area, and had a bad EHD outbreak last September. Short of controlling the weather, is there anything we can do to help our deer and other vulnerable species avoid it? Uh, with hemorrhagic disease, and you're right, we did have a bad year last year. Uh, that, is, that is disease ecology. That is the natural cycle of that disease. It's not something to worry about in the big picture of things. Um, so the best things that you can do are, are keep your deer habitat as low stress on deer as possible uh, and give them some time and space to recover. Um, EHDV and, and blue tongue virus are a natural part. Um, they're endemic. Well, uh, EHDV, at least certain serotypes, are endemic to the southeast. So the deer population is capable of, of handling it as it comes through. But you're right, it, it is tough. And last year was particularly hard. All right, our next question is from Clyde Brown. What is the latest range of the second tapeworm? He's in Pennsylvania and you said it was working towards North Carolina. Echinococcus multilacularis. Uh, yeah, that one's, <laughs> it is moving here. We do, um, our fur bear and uh, black bear biologist, same person, uh, is absolutely amazing. And she's doing some pretty incredible work looking at these sort of middle carnivore species. Um, and we are specifically looking for that particular echinococcus. We're looking at all of them really, if they were to pop up, but we are looking for uh, Motilacularis and we have not found it yet. I do know there've been records in Virginia, so it is not that far away. Um, and I believe there are also records farther south than us as well. Uh, but they're a little bit few and far between. It's not as common as it is in the mid-Atlantic and Northeast, but it is coming here. A uh, question from an anonymous attendee. Uh, what online resources are there for landowners, communities, and professionals to assess information on biodiversity ideas and options and spread the word? I will get back to you on that one. I can pass that um, uh, along to Bob. I'm going to have to ask for a phone a friend on that. My, my, um, my background and, and my career is in wildlife disease. And so I don't have a, an easy access to biodiversity resources, but we can get some for you. Yep. And when you share those with me, Sarah, we'll put those on the portal page where people join today and they'll be able to get to them there. Perfect. Next question is from Chris Grayson uh, out of Indiana. What is being done about feral cats? Do they spread disease? They have certainly disseminated, decimated uh, the songbird population. Yeah, feral cats. Um, so feral cats are a difficult one because they're a domestic animal and domestic animals don't fall under the purview of the Wildlife Resources Commission. Um, we have uh, had biologists that contribute to a um, position statement through the Wildlife Society. Um, and generally speaking, what we can say is we don't support feral cats. Um, but again, that's as they are domestics, that's not part of the wildlife resources in the state. It's always a touchy subject with feral cats. And you're right, they have absolutely decimated the, the songbird population. Uh, next question is from Aaron Arneson. How can people without much land in neighborhoods increase diversity? Can gardens help? Absolutely. This is probably my favorite kind of question. So thank you for asking it. I live in a city. I mean, technically I live on the outskirts of a city. So I, I feel this at my core. 
Um, it's amazing what you can do even with small amounts of land. Uh, if you can pool your resources, if you've got physically touching neighbors and you all want to contribute together, you can make a much bigger plot of land. And if you don't and you don't want to talk to your neighbors, that's fine too. You can still make um, choices as you're putting things in your yard that support native wildlife and that's picking native plants. Just because you can buy it at Lowe's or Home Depot doesn't make it a native plant. Just because it grows here doesn't make it a native plant. So really look at your, um, like NCSU has got a great extension resource and look at your native plant lists and see what kind of fits what you're looking for. Are you looking to attract moths, butterflies, bees? Are you looking to attract different kinds of birds to your backyard? Um, those types of, or do you want to support, you know, ground cover for broadhead skinks. I have so many broadhead skinks on my property and I love them. Uh, and they eat the ants. So I don't have to worry so much about ants in my in my house because I've got skinks everywhere. Uh, you don't have to make big changes and a garden is a great way to start. Um, one of the things I did, and this won't work for everyone, is uh, I have a stretch of road along my fence line and it goes straight out to the car. It's like your regular tree buffer. There's no trees on it. It gets full sun. I plant a ton of native wildflowers pretty much every spring and I don't have to mow it, which is a huge plus for me. And I get all sorts of little tiny bugs that I can't identify and moths and some butterflies too. Um, it, it's amazing. And even things like just not raking per, per, so, you know, areas of your yard over the, uh, the end of the summer. I have a ton of fireflies in my yard because I'm a lazy gardener and I don't rake up the leaves, but that gives them a place to lay eggs and then hatch out. And I've got just a riot of light and color in the evenings in the summer that my neighbors don't have. So no, you don't need pl big plots of land. Just pick the kind of species you're looking for and try to support them uh, and do it with as, as much native plants as you can. All right. The next question is from Chris Grayson, again from Indiana. Do typical wormy medications for household dogs prevent the tapeworms? That is a question uh, between you and your veterinarian. And I'm going to leave it at that. Okay. A uh, question from Paul Dean. What do you mean by feathered edges? Yeah. Um, I meant to put a picture of this and I, and I actually didn't. So feathered edges. So if you think about, um, you know, when you're driving down the road and um, you know, the DOT has come by with their great big mowers and they've literally put a mower straight up in the air and done a pass. That's a hard edge. A feathered edge is uh, working from that low grass, heavily mowed area and trying to work your way up more softly back into uh, the, the healthy forest that is hopefully behind it or whatever the healthy habitat system that's behind it is. And so you would potentially be thinning trees as you get close to that area and then building in brushes and taller grasses, working your way down into more sparsely lower grasses and some other uh, maybe flowering plants. But basically try to lessen um, by feathering, that's where the word comes in, that hard edge going into well, another hard edge, asphalt and, and turf grass. So it's trying to make it as soft as possible so that smaller birds and mammals can move around in safety. So that, that way they're not just straight chucked out into the middle of the road as, as is normal when you have a hard edge. All right, the next question from uh, Stephanie following on to Chris's question. We have a bad problem with hunting hound trespass during firearm season. It is devastating to all wildlife, turkey, deer, fox, woodcocks, et cetera, and domestic livestock. Has North Carolina had this issue and was it resolved? North Carolina, in, in general, the statement of the commission, we do support our hound hunters. It's a tradition here. Um, there are areas, probably fairly large areas of the state where it's up to the counties and the municipalities whether they will or will not allow hound hunting, but the state of North Carolina does allow hound hunting. Um, that issue with trespass is always a, a concern um, and, and it can be handled in a few different ways, but um, you know, we've had some 
some game lands now that are completely surrounded and they weren't when the game land was formed but now they're completely surrounded in subdivisions and neighborhoods and um and we've since stopped hound hunting on those particular game lands or maybe game lands in those areas but in general um you know the the trespass issue is a problem pretty much anywhere you're going to have hounds running freely uh, and I can't say that we've solved the problem. We we address it as it comes up, I'd say is the way that, that we work with it. Um, but our commission does support hound hunting. So at the end of the day. Uh, next question uh, from anonymous attendee is creating wildlife habitats at a small scale, example, pollinator to habitat, perennial native trees, et cetera, in your backyard beneficial or does it create more fragmented habitats causing more harm than good? I'm going to say the, the, the scale when you're talking about backyards is almost irrelevant, right? Your neighborhood is what's creating the fragmented habitat. So making a small stopover point in your yard is going to do more good than harm. In most cases, you're not going to be bringing in hundreds of thousands of birds into your one spot. They're not going to find it and you won't have that much food there. Um, so I would say in general, you know, you, you are creating more good than harm for the, the species that show up. And even if it's the species who are already there, their residents, they hang out all the time, you're giving them a more varied and more appropriate source of food. So I would say they're more benefit than they than they could be harm. All right, next question is from Joe Sullivan. Diseases serve as density controls on overpopulated species, especially where other density controls such as predation, hunting, do if in balance with the prey population. I think that's a statement more than a question, but yes, yep, I... <laughs> uh, you're absolutely correct. Yeah, um, it's part of the reason we're struggling, I think, with uh, redefining what wildlife health is because we went so long with the definition that wildlife health is the absence of disease. That's not true. Um, wildlife health is the resilience, I, I think. There, there has to be some comment in there about resiliency. It's the ability to adjust and recover when there are stressors and some of those stressors are disease, but you're absolutely right. Like disease is a natural part of the world and it can um, certainly come into play when you're dealing with overpopulation. Yeah. Uh, question from anonymous attendee. What dimensions do you recommend for edge feathering on isolated woods on farm ground in an attempt to connect tree areas? I, I will get back to you. I've got a resource for that um, actually out of Kentucky um that i will have i will send over to bob and we'll get that posted for you all right question from dwight o'neill do we know if there have been any instances of white-tailed deer developing a resistance to cwd Ooh, an easy answer no <laughs> it's a chronic wasting disease which is cwd uh is a fatal neurologic disease of deer it is fatal um, there is no resistance known. There are some, if you want to really dig into the weeds about it, there are maybe some genetic makeups of some individual animals that might prolong the amount of time that that animal has while they are ill, but it is not true resistance to the disease. It's just a lengthening of their living time after they've contracted it. And there are pros and cons to that because it's a disease that's spread. Yeah, so the longer they're alive, the longer they're spreading it around. All right, we've got one more question that's come in or comment it's a actually comment, from yeah. Kara. If you're interested in creating or renovating wildlife habitat or edge feathering on your property, call your local USDA Natural Resource Conservation Service office. That's awesome. Good job, NRCS. <laughs> All right, folks, if uh, we still have a few minutes, if you have any more questions, please enter them into the Q&A feature uh, so we can get those answered. As uh, Sarah indicated, uh, the resources she will share with us, we will get placed on the portal here uh, soon, um, as soon as they're available to us. And with today's webinar being recorded, uh, that recording will also be available 
on the webinar using the same link you joined today. And with that, I'm not seeing any other questions, but let's, uh, one more time, let's uh, remind you of upcoming events with the North Carolina Tree Farm Program here. Uh, the Restoring Oak Forest uh, Workshop will take place October 3rd and 4th here in North Carolina. Uh, Leslie, correct me if I'm wrong, but that will take place at the Cooperative Extension Center in Pittsburgh, North Carolina, correct? The first day will, and the second day will be in the field in Northern Orange County at the Orange Water and Sewer Authority um, land property in Northern Orange County. So there'll be one classroom day and one field day. And so consider registering through the North Carolina Tree Farm Program website. Um, and I'll post the link to that here in a second in the chat. Uh, also, uh, the next webinar is scheduled for November 2nd. Uh, and that's building and maintaining trails. And you'll hear from uh, an extension associate, Ann Savage, here with the North Carolina State University's Park Recreation and Tourism Department. And last but not least, if you want more information on the North Carolina Tree Farm Program, please do reach out to them. It's a great organization and it's a great way to get more information and education about forestry. So see if we have any more questions or comments have come in. Nope, that looks like it. Let me share um, the link to the Tree Farm Program. You click on that link, you'll get to be able to get to their resources and see about the trainings and everything. And with that, let's uh, thank Sarah for uh, her hard work and everything. Uh, appreciate all that you did to put this webinar together. It was a fantastic topic and you did a great job. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. All right, everybody, we appreciate you participating today. Please remember to fill out the uh, evaluation that will be back on the portal page where you joined. Uh, if you need continuing education credits, you will have to fill that out uh, as part of that process. So thank you all very much and enjoy your day.